introduction to uh, John Glass here. Romans 10 and verse 14, and it says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And we're going to hear from a man this morning that's the preacher, a man that believes this verse. Many churches or a lot of people, a lot of Christians, even some of us, don't believe in this verse. How will they hear without a preacher? And a lot of people think that people can hear the gospel and the way of salvation just by life. And uh, somehow when you say grace, unless it's a long grace or something, you know, uh, but here's a preacher. And for 28 years he's been preaching the gospel and doing mission work. And I hadn't heard of uh, John until Jerry Ragg, and we all know Jerry, he used to be the co-pastor here and still is probably from distance. But um, Jerry said, Russ, you've got to get John Glass down here. You've got to get him. you just got to get him. And, uh, and he said, when you get I want to come with him. Uh, but Jerry's not here, John, but you've got Meg, and she's wonderful as well, and so that's absolutely great. Um, uh, but anyway, a couple of years ago, I met John at, at a Shepherds Conference, and, um, and then oh, probably three years ago, it might have been four, I forget now, but anyway, two years ago, we spent some time at the Missions Conference together and got to know them a little wee bit, and so anyway, John and Meg are down here, and we give you an incredible uh, welcome. The conference, as you know, is about preaching the gospel. It's about the gospel, uh, and it's the, some of the deepest theology, is, uh, yet it's the simplest, it's the most life-changing, um, and it's the message that God has given us to change lives. Well, he changes the lives as we preach it clearly. But, you know, there's that deep theology of the gospel and the nature and the character of God that's entwined in the gospel, but then it's lived out in our lives. And as we hear, John, you'll see this incredible synergy of the deepest the- of theology coming together with life practice, and he'll join it together for us, and every time he speaks, I'm sure I know that, and uh, I hear those reports of him. He's very charismatic, as you will see, um, in his uh, nature, Um, probably not theology, but um, in his nature, and um, so my heart resonates with him and uh, in that, and I'm sure that we'll join. John, would you come up, please, and we'll just say thank you. He's got a bio in the and the um, little pamphlet conference guide that we have, and we're going to hear something of his life and journeys. So um, he will tell you better uh, uh, about what the Lord's doing through him uh, than, than what I can. But, but John, welcome. Let me Thank pray you, with Russell. You. Oh, sure. Great. <coughs> Father, we bow before you again this morning, and we uh, just uplift John to you. Let him be your voice. Let him, uh, would you speak through him this morning to us? Would you awaken our hearts? Would you light a fire in every heart here? today to go from here with that incredible commitment to, to preach the gospel, to, sh- to tell others of the gospel, to make disciples, to uh, serve Christ, our King, in a, in a way that we've never done before, with courage and with power and with truth. Father, help us to speak the truth uh, to all that we meet. We ask this in Jesus' name. Bless your word now. We say thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, New Zealand. This is fun. So excited to be in New Zealand. We're really south here. It's incredible. En fait, j'ai envie de vous parler en français un petit peu parce que j'aimerais que vous entendiez ce que je fais tous les dimanches. Alors, je suis en train de parler français. Si vous comprenez ce que je dis, levez la main. Qui comprend? Levez les mains. If you understand what I'm saying in French, levez la main. J'aimerais voir les mains. Thank you. I'm recruiting. Okay, so we need you. I see that some of you speak French very... Did I say something wrong already? <laughs> oh, no. Oh. We've got to have an interpreter. Oh. <laughs> hey, you did... This, this is what he said. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad to be here. And Russell, you're just a wonderful, wonderful chap. <laughs> I like you. You're cool. <laughs> Amen. Vive la France. Super. Well, he said I was kind of charismatic, so, you know. I mean <laughs> well, anyway, it is great to be here. My wife, Meg, and I were here actually 33 years ago because we took our honeymoon to New Zealand. And the reason is, yes, thank you very much, because we were actually both flight attendants at the time with Pan Am, and we had free tickets. 
And so for $50, we flew first class. That was really cool. And we came down to New Zealand, and actually we did the South Island all the way to Milford Sound. Got a car, almost got killed about 18 times. But it was really neat. And so we'd, we'd actually never been except at the airport to the North Island. So thank you, Russell, for the invitation. It's a delight to be here and to discover your beautiful North Island. We went up to the top of that mountain there called Timata and uh, saw the view, took pictures. It's all over Facebook. It's absolutely wonderful. So we thank God for that. It's a great privilege to be here for the Impact Bible Conference with Mike and uh, just a, a great privilege to be able to share my heart. And um, Mike is more doing the evangelism tract and I'm sort of doing the missions track. So that's what I'm going to be speaking on uh, in these few sessions. And this morning I was asked, as I was, as we were talking about what to give, I was asked to start with the story of my testimony and then weave it in so that you'll understand how it all fits in with missions. So uh, I've entitled my sermon, One Verse, Five Minutes, and a Little Bit of Courage. And uh, let me go ahead and pray, and then I'll explain to you what this is all about. Lord, we thank you for the great and awesome privilege of being here at this conference for every person here. And Lord, um, we know that we're all here if we know Christ because one day someone shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. And we thank you for those people who did that. And Lord, uh, it is our turn to do that. And sometimes it's scary. And so I pray this morning as we expound the word of God that you would give us each just a little bit more courage in this area. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. One verse, five minutes, and a little bit of courage. <clears throat> really, what I would like to do, and this is kind of a pretty big thing to say, but I'm going to try and show you how to become a missionary today in one sermon. So after this sermon, you will know how to be a missionary. So the way I'm going to do this is, first of all, tell you my story. And then we're going to expound Acts 8, the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And then we're going to put it together to see what the key is to successful missions is. So hopefully it'll be very simple, and hopefully we're all going to get really excited at the end of this sermon to be missionaries, okay? So let me just first of all back up and tell you my story. I was born in Paris, France in 1956. My parents were both Americans. My mom was from Oklahoma and my father was from Colorado. My dad was a businessman and so they moved to Paris. My, actually, my grandfather had a company back in America. He was selling a certain item that they wanted to sell here in er Europe. So my dad and my mom came and uh, lived in Paris and that's where I was born in 1956, December 14th. A few months later, the Suez War broke out between France and Egypt, and so a lot of foreigners were a little nervous, and so they, many of them left France, and my parents chose to move to Geneva, Switzerland, which is surrounded by France. Actually, uh, we live in France today, but we live one kilometer from Geneva. Actually, I'm a church planter in Geneva, but we live right near there, and a lot of, a lot of people do that. So my parents moved to Geneva, Switzerland, and I was raised in Geneva for the first 15 years of my life. So that's why I speak French. I speak French like I speak English just because I was born and raised there. But I was not a believer. Uh, we did not have a Christian family. My parents didn't know the Lord. But we were church goers. And so we went to the Episcopalian Church of Geneva. Now, I never heard the gospel in that church, but they had great coffee. So I enjoyed the coffee, and uh, it was sort of the, the American club of Geneva in those days, and a lot of people, all the, the Americans sort of hung out there, and we did go to church. The funny story, this is a side note, about two months ago, I was invited to go back to that church, the Episcopalian Church of Geneva, and preach, and I did. It was absolutely fantastic, but that's a whole other story. So anyway, I was raised in this church, I didn't know the Lord. And at the age of 15, my parents decided to send me away to boarding school, which is what a lot of expats did. So I um, went off to Eglon College in Switzerland. That was a really rough school. Uh, our, it was up in the Alps, and we had to, this is required, ski three hours a day. 
Oh, it was a horrible experience, I'll tell you. Anyway, so from there, they sent me to the Lawrenceville Prep School in New Jersey, and that was a difficult experience. That was an all-boys school. <clears throat> but anyway, that's the way it was. Stayed there, and then I went on to Syracuse University in upstate New York. And um, got to Syracuse University, and my major, I, 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 it was very simple. I looked at a map, and I wanted to be an international businessman like my dad. And so I looked at the map, and in those days, I knew French and English, and I figured the language I needed to know was Spanish. So I became a major of Spanish language and literature and did sort of a minor in business and thought I would uh, be able to become a businessman and make my millions. Well, that didn't exactly happen either. But during my first year of college, what happened is that I sort of became a hippie. It was actually more than sort of. I, I, I began to live the lifestyle of a hippie. In those days, we had long hair. So imagine me with hair down to here, a ponytail, that's right, and I was um, living a life of immorality. I was smoking a lot of stuff I shouldn't have been smoking. And this was my life. I was just having fun, cruising through university. And what's happened is I began to, to, to live this lifestyle. I sensed in my heart something really empty. There was an emptiness there. I was, I was really struggling, trying to figure all this out. And I really got to a crisis point after my first year of university. And so I decided, and this you can do in America. I don't know how it is here in New Zealand. But in America, you can take a year off of university, no problem, and then go back. So I told my parents, look, I think I need to take a year off of school and uh, just go think. And they said, that's a great idea. My parents were really into letting us do what kind of whatever we wanted to do. So I decided to, to take a year off of college. This was 1976. I went back to Geneva, Switzerland. And I wanted to take the trip of my life. Now, we were travelers. My dad traveled a lot. He took us a lot of places. So I was traveling was in my skin sort of thing. And, um, and uh, so I, I got back to Geneva, summer 1976, and I got a job um, working in a restaurant serving fish and french fries. And that was fun for about three weeks. And I realized, you know what? I, I just need to go travel. So I took a backpack. I put about 15 uh, pounds or maybe 10 kilos of clothes in there, just the basic minimum what I needed. Um, took a passport, took all my life savings. So I gathered all my savings together, and my budget was three U.S. dollars a day. Now, this is a long time ago, okay? This is uh, 1976. You could go a lot farther than today, but that was my budget. So on June 23rd, 1976, I was ready to go. So I took my backpack, went to the Geneva train station, got on a train, and if you're, I'm just going to sort of draw the map here, okay, it's a virtual map. For the first month, this is what I did. I left Switzerland and I went through Germany, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, Greece. My goal, oh, we're going to, that's, you can leave that up there, but we'll show the rest of the slides at the very end, okay? So just this one for now. So, well, actually, can you just maybe, yeah, let's take that off and let me explain all this. Thank you. That's all right. Now you know that's okay. So anyway, I went to Greece because my goal was to go to Greece and get a tan. <laughs> that's right. Yes, I can tan. It is incredible to imagine that, but that is possible. So I went to Greece. I picked six islands. And for the next six weeks, I just island hopped and lived the life of a hippie on the islands of Greece. Those are the days where you could actually sleep on the beach, sleep on the sand, do whatever you want. So that's what I did. And I was doing all the stuff that I was doing back at Syracuse. And you know what? I was living like the life of a king, except that I began to feel in my heart a real emptiness. I was empty. So I thought, okay, I've got to do something else with my life. So I met a guy, and he said, look, you can go to Israel and work, get a job in a kibbutz. So I said, cool, that's what I'm doing. So I took off from Greece, flew to Israel, and there the next day I was on kibbutz Betashita. I don't know if you've ever been there. That's in Israel, in the center of Israel, in the, between Afula and Betshean. And the next morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was picking olives in the olive groves. Well, that was a blast for about two hours. <laughs> and I realized, wow, you know what? I, I've got a problem in my life. It's like school is not cutting it. Work in Geneva is not cutting it. 
The beaches of Greece are not cutting it. And now working in Israel is not cutting it. So I was getting a little nervous, thinking, what's life all about? I was 19 years old, and I was going through a life crisis. So after about three weeks, I left the kibbutz, and I went to Jerusalem to check it out as a tourist. And I bought a little guide, and it said, uh, what you need to see in Jerusalem is the garden tomb where Jesus was buried. I thought, well, that sounds interesting. So I'm kind of an early morning guy. Got there. I was the first one there. Walked in the garden, paid, and boom, there in front of me was the tomb of Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, that is weird. That is the tomb of Jesus Christ. And I walked inside the tomb of Jesus Christ. It's empty. And I was inside it looking around. And I got cold chills on my entire body just thinking to myself, that's like weird. I'm inside the tomb of Jesus. I walked out and I went to Golgotha, which is right next to it. This is where he was crucified. And you can see there kind of a skull-shaped hill right in front of you. And I looked at that and then there was a plaque and it said, this is where Jesus was crucified. And I began to weep like a baby. But I didn't know why. It was the strangest thing. So I thought, ah, this is stupid. This is stupid. So I wiped my tears off and got tough. And left the garden, bummed around Israel for another month or two, went down to Noeba, which is today part of Egypt, went scuba diving and stuff. That was kind of cool. And, um, and finally, I was going through this crisis again, unfulfillment. So I met this guy, and he said, John, if you want to figure out what life is all about, you need to go to Asia. I said, cool, I'm going. So I left Israel, went back to Greece, up to Istanbul. Now, if you're looking in the map again, we don't have to show it, I'll just explain it. If this is Europe, there's one bridge in Istanbul, and that's Asia. So that's how they divide Asia and Europe. And that bridge is in Istanbul. So everyone in those days, there were cars and buses and all these people traveling all over, all those countries were open. So I got to Istanbul, and I saw a bright blue bus, and it said, Riders Wanted for India, $40. I thought, wow, that's a sweet deal. Now, the problem is I didn't know where India was, so I bought a map, and I realized that's a very long trip. But I thought, this is great. So I got on that bus, paid $40, and for the next six weeks, long bus ride, for the next six weeks, we went from Turkey, through Turkey, through Iran, through Afghanistan, through Pakistan, down into India. Now, a lot happened on that trip, especially the drugs, a ton of drugs. It was a bright blue bus. There were about 15 or 20 of us on there. They were all mostly German hippies going to Nepal for drug deals. They were going to hide all the drugs in the bus and come back. So I got a ride with them, and we went through Turkey, through Iran. They said no drugs in Iran. In those days, if you were caught with drugs in Iran, you'd get uh, killed. So no drugs in Iran. But when we got to Afghanistan, the whole thing changed. And so the drugs came out on the bus, and then we got arrested in, uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan. And that was the scariest day of my life. They confiscated our passports and threatened to put us in jail. And I thought, John, what on earth are you doing with your life? I mean, I was no druggie. You know, I, I was just like a normal guy, just like having fun. But here I was, threatened with jail. So I got very nervous. They gave us our passport back. They let us go. We went through uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, finally got to India. And in India, all my friends, these guys on the bus began to shoot up with heroin and stuff, and I thought, that's not me. You know, we all have a conscious bar, and my conscience did not allow me to go there. So I thought, this is too much. Now I'm really lost. And then I got off the bus, said goodbye to these people. We were in New Delhi. And now I was being hit by the poverty in India. I'd never seen poverty like that in my life. Uh, people just sleeping, dying, cows everywhere, people with red dots here, I mean, turbans. And, I mean, it's like a really crazy place. It's sort of like Indiana Jones with all the dust. That's the way I perceived India, and that's the way it was to me. And it was overwhelming. So I thought, what do I do now? So with the money I had left, I always had enough money for a plane ticket. I bought a plane ticket home. The next day, I was going home. I was walking down the street all by myself in New Delhi on Jan Path Avenue. And I bumped into a guy. He was a European guy with blonde, long hair. 
he was giving out pieces of paper to people. So I was curious. He was a missionary. He was a missionary handing out tracts to people. The nicest guy. He was from Holland. So he began to talk. He said, John, let's go get a Coke. I said, okay. So we went and got a Coke. And we were there having a Coke somewhere in New Delhi on Janpath Avenue. And suddenly, this is what he did. He said, John, can I show you one verse in the Bible? <sighs> oh, man. Oh, Christians? Bible? Oh, I-, I knew Christians back at Syracuse University. The Christians at Syracuse all looked like me today, okay? They had short hair. <laughs> Short hair, blue blazers, gray slacks, okay? Then they carried Bibles, and they told you about Jesus. And I thought, ah, I can't stand these Christians. Then he said this, and you can try it one day. He says, John, this is the best seller in the history of the world. You need to know one verse. Try it. It works. I thought, huh, okay. Fatal okay. Guess what verse he opened it to? John 3.16. I'd never heard in my life. So he opened it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I said, great. He said, John, let's analyze the verse. <sighs> okay. He says, look, for God so loved the world. What does the word world mean? I'm sorry, I'm thinking, huh. World means world, exactly. Everybody, God loves Indians, he loves Americans, imagine. He loves French, wow, you know. He loves New Zealanders, he loves the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Who's that? Context, Jesus Christ. Wow, flashback to Israel. I'd been in the tomb of Jesus, I had been at Golgotha. Suddenly, as he was showing me this verse, it's like it popped out. It was like, whoa, historically I had been there just a few months before. Suddenly I got nervous. He said, for God so loved the world. Then he substituted the word world with my name. He said, for God so loved John that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who came, God in human flesh. He died. He took the sins on the world, died and rose again. He conquered sin and grants forgiveness. For God so loved John that he gave his only begotten son. Then he said this, look, for whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He says, John, you've got a choice. Here it is. Number one, you can reject Jesus Christ. You can reject what he did for you. You can reject his death and his resurrection. And you will die in your sin. And the Bible says you will perish. Perish. You will be cut for all eternity from a holy God. And you will have to deal with eternal suffering separated from a holy God. That is what perish means. Or, for God so loved John that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He says, or you can trust Christ as your Savior, embrace him, repent of your sin, believe, trust Christ, embrace him, and he will give you eternal life. He will wash your sins away and give you eternal life. Then he said, John, what do you want to do? Man, I was getting so nervous. My heart was pounding. But you know what? As he was sharing that one verse, I knew one thing, that I was a rotten sinner before a holy God. I knew that. I said, no. I got up and I walked out. The guy followed me down the street. And he spun me around in Jan Path Avenue. He said, John, this is your last chance. Like, pretty direct. (laughs) I said, okay. So I was thinking to myself, look, if this is not true, Nothing will happen. But if this is true, everything will happen. I mean, if the gospel is true, it's going to have a radical effect in a person's life, right? If it's fake and wrong and a lie, nothing will happen. 
So I thought, what do I have to lose? This is going in my mind really fast here. What do I have to lose? One thing, my sin. But I didn't like it anyway. What do I have to gain? Eternal life. That's the way I was understanding it just in that moment. I said, okay. So I bowed my head right there in the street, November 2nd, 1976. I said, Jesus Christ, this sounds right. This sounds right. I hate my sin. I believe that you died and rose again for it. So right now, I want to believe. Just like the verse says, I ask you, I ask you right now to save me. I ask you right now to wash my sin away and to grant me eternal life exactly like the verse says. You know what happened? Nothing. (laughs) It's like there was no lightning in the sky, no thunder, no voice from God. Oh, but you know what happened actually? At that instant, at that exact instant, all my sins, past, present, and future, were completely wiped away. At that instant, I received eternal life, just like that. At that instant, the God of the universe invaded my little heart, invaded my life, and transformed me. He rose me from the dead. He gave me life. At that instant, I was an absolutely transformed man, but I didn't quite know it yet. So I said to this guy, thank you, goodbye. It's true. Now let me tell you this. That man used one verse, five minutes, with a little bit of courage. Totally changed my life. Now listen to this. He has no idea what happened to me. I don't even know his name. I left him. I have no idea what happened to him. He has no idea what happened to me. He doesn't have a clue. Today, I'm a missionary. He has no idea. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe in cold turkey evangelism? Does that expression here, do you have that one? Okay, you get that, you get that, the question? Okay. Now, be careful with your answer. Do you believe in cold turkey evangelism? Thank you. I hope you say yes, because I am the direct result of it. I mean, someone just took one verse, John 3.16, five minutes, had a little bit of courage, totally, totally changed my life. Next day, I got on the airplane. I'm heading back to Switzerland, so I get on the airplane, go Geneva, Bombay, and uh, long story, but I, I, I had a little New Testament. I knew a Christian girl back in Syracuse, and we played jazz together. I'm, I like music and stuff, and, uh, and so she was a flutist, and one day I was leaving from college. I didn't like Christians. She was nice because we played music, and I had get, received the first day of school a little green Gideon Bible, and it stayed in my, my desk for like a whole year, and then I was leaving the day, and I had my stuff on my desk, so she came in to say goodbye. She took the Gideon Bible. She says, John, please put this in your backpack. You never know. I said, oh, okay, threw it in. I mean, like eight months later, boom, there is the little New Testament in my backpack. So I pull this thing out. I began to read it. And so I get on the airplane the next day. I've got this crisp new Gideon's Bible in one verse, John 3.16. I turn to the guy next to me. He's Muslim. (laughs) I say, sir, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. He can completely wash your sins away. And he said, "Uh, what is your problem? You know, I mean, he just did not, (laughs) you know, (laughs) This is a real problem, and I realized, wow, you know, I am not ready to go home and share my verse with my family. They're going to think I'm crazy. So I got off the plane, went down to Goa, because Goa is where all these uh, hippies were going, basically, to live off coconuts and bananas. And on the, <laughs> on the, I was running out of money, and on the boat, I met missionaries again. And so they said, well, come and live with us. So I lived with them for a month down in Goa. It was really cool. They were just, like, giving me this, you know, massive Bible verses in my brain and in my heart. It was just thrilling time. And then a month later, I thought, okay, it's time for me to go home. So I went back to Geneva, went back from uh, up up to Bombay, flew back home, got my hair cut because my mom didn't like long hair, and finally went home. And um, 
It was just an incredible new life. I felt bad for my parents because they saw their son leave as a hippie and come back as a Jesus fanatic. So that was a little hard on them. They thought, oh, here's another, another fade in his life, you know, phase or whatever. But it wasn't, and I knew that the Lord had completely changed my life. And so uh, from there, I was just reading my Bible. I couldn't stop reading it. And I finally went back to Syracuse University, but I got into Syracuse, and I didn't know anyone. I mean, no one. And so I called up the operator. I just, you know, then you could just call up zero, and the operator, hello, this is the operator. And I said, hello, uh, this is John Glass, and I need Christians. Can you please point me to Christians? She said, just a minute, please. And do 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 She was looking for Christians and finally gave me the campus groups, and I ended up with Campus Crusade for Christ. Do you have them down here? Because I love the four spiritual laws. Oh, I know it's imperfect, but I didn't know anything. And I thought, wow, this is like so much fun. You can take this little booklet, you can read it with someone. And I saw all these people embrace Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I thought, this is fun. I mean, it's not complicated. It's really fun. And I realized that what you need to do is just to use one verse, five minutes, with a little bit of courage. And you can see lives completely transformed. And if you don't know that verse very well, you can use this little booklet. And there's a ton of those out there. And that can help you guide someone through uh, with the gospel. And it was a thrilling thing. So from there, just to finish our story, I graduated from college three years later. And I, uh, be, I needed a job. I, I was feeling called to the ministry. I just didn't know how. And, um, and so I got a job with Pan Am as a flight attendant. And one day I was in the crew lounge at New York. And this most, the most beautiful Christian flight attendant walked in. We met through a mutual friend, and I married her. Yeah, so that was great. So this is Meg. We've been married 33 years and came here on our, uh, on our honeymoon. And uh, from there, we'd heard about the ministry of John MacArthur. And so we went out to California. I did my seminary training out there as we were really feeling the tug of the Lord. And I, I also realized, wow, you know, I mean, I was raised in Geneva, Switzerland, the city of Calvin. I never heard the gospel. I thought, this is the wrong scenario. So I asked the Lord if one day we might be able to go back to Geneva and there preach the gospel. And by God's beautiful grace, we've been there now for 20 years. We're 10 years in Paris, 20 years in Geneva, and we just started a brand new church about eight years ago. And so I'm doing exactly what the Lord granted me to do, to preach in Geneva, Switzerland. It's amazing. I'm right there in my hometown. So it's been very, very exciting. So, so that's my story. So now what I'd like to do is you go, okay, so that's interesting. How do we fit this with Acts chapter 8. Take your Bibles and let me show you this. This is very, very exciting. Go with me to Acts chapter 8, and I would like to show you, using these two stories put together, the keys to successful missions. The keys to successful missions. How to be a missionary, okay? And there are really three keys to being an effective evangelist or an effective missionary, And we're going to start our story in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. But before we do that, let me give you the first key to effective evangelism or effective missions. Here it is. Here it is. To be an effective missionary, number one, there must be the preparation of the messenger. There must be the preparation of the messenger. There must be a messenger. Look at verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join the chariot. And Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are saying? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. We'll stop there. We'll come back to it in just a second. So you see, here we have an example of how evangelism and missions should be done. And the first key is that there must be the preparation of a messenger. You see, it's interesting to think about this. God needs to find the right messenger. It's worth to think about this. Let me ask you a question. If God wanted to save the world, could he, could he, take the clouds and write out John 3.16 
in any language of the world so that people would continuously see John 3.16 written with clouds in the sky. Could he do that? Yes or no? Does he do that? Why not? Good question, isn't it? Could he do the same with stars? Could he line up all the stars of the sky and write John 3.16 in 152 languages? Could he do that? Does he do that? No. Why not? Well, I'll tell you why not. Because that's not his plan. That's not his plan. Matthew 28, the verse that you mentioned last night, Mike. Matthew 28, in verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, God's plan has always been, always been, to use a messenger. Always. This is the way he's worked it out. He wants people to proclaim the truth. Ah, but then the question is, what kind of people does he want to proclaim the truth? What are the qualifications to be used as a messenger? Well, it's interesting. We can go to Acts 8 and think about who Philip was to figure out what kind of messenger he was and what we can glean from his life. What are the characteristics in the life of Philip that made him be used so wonderfully of the Lord to lead this man to Christ? Well, to find out, we got to go actually to Acts chapter 6 because this is where we discover him for the first time. So we're in Acts chapter 6, and you remember the situation the church in Jerusalem has just really grown, has been birthed. Thousands of people have come to Christ. There's a lot of excitement in the city. There's commotion. And in all of this, the Greek widows were neglected in the distribution of food, as you remember. The church remedies the problem by selecting some key men to organize the food distribution. Well, Philip is one of the key men chosen. See, in verse 5, it says... And so he heard these words, I'm sorry, I got the wrong chapter there. Acts, uh, the statement found approval, Acts 6, 5, with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Notice that our man is number two man in that list. So, what do we find out about him? What are the key traits in his life? Well, first of all, in verse 3, it says this. It is not desirable, verse 2, for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation. The first thing is that he had a good reputation. Very interesting. So, what does that mean? What is a good reputation? A good reputation is what people are saying about you. When you speak bad of a person, it may be gossip, but it may also reveal what kind of reputation that person has. Actually, a reputation is what people say about you when you're not around. And it's interesting that in his case, he had a good reputation. Proverbs 22.1 says a good name is to be more desirable than great wealth. Ecclesiastes 7.1 says a good name is better than good ointment. So he had a good reputation. Isn't that interesting? Number two, he was full of the Holy Spirit. We're in verse 3 again. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of spirit and of wisdom. Full of the spirit. His life was controlled by Christ and his Holy Spirit that had come down in Acts 2. The fruit of the spirit was visible in his life. He he fled the works of the flesh. He lived a holy life. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. He was a holy man. Third, he was full of wisdom, verse 3 says. You know, it's interesting in French, you know French a little bit. When we say that a child is obedient, we say, tiens, l'enfant est sage. We say that is a wise child. What does that mean? That means wisdom is the application of knowledge. An obedient child is a child that understands what he must do, what he must do, and does it. So this is what Philip was. He was a wise man. He was a holy man. He was an obedient man. In verse 5, we also find out that he is submissive. In verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. 
and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip. It's interesting that when he was proposed to the apostles to distribute food, he accepted the job. He accepted the job. I mean, he could have thought, wow, this is like a really menial task. I mean, I got to serve widows. Oh, this is really exciting. No, he never questioned that. He said, this is what the job needs to be done. Let's just do it. So he was very submissive. He was humble. He was willing to serve in this small, menial task of serving tables. Nothing glorious. By the way, this is how you gain a good reputation in life. If you want a good reputation, serve. Serve in small things. And people will go, wow, this person, that person, look at them. They serve faithfully in small tasks, and they will want to raise you up. If you wait to get the big task, they're going to put you down. That's the way it goes. So he was a man who was humble. But this is so exciting. He's also a man of the word. In verse chapter 8 now, persecution hits. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. There's this persecution that hits Jerusalem. People are scattered, verse 4. Now look at this, verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip, here's our guy, Here's the guy, the humble servant in the church. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits that were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was much rejoicing in the city. Wow. So here's the guy who was a humble guy in the church. Now he's out there proclaiming Christ powerfully. God gives him the gift of miracles, the gift of healings. There's revival in Samaria going on. Now here's the last characteristic of this man that I love. In chapter 8, verse 26, look at this. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Philip, go up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. He could have said, wait a minute, God. You are using me right now for a revival in Samaria. You want me to leave this? To go down to the desert where there's no people? Why? Look at the success. That's not how he responds. That's not how he responds. Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. He didn't even know why he was going. He just went. He was obedient. He knew that there was no better place to be than in the absolute center of the will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is looking for messengers. He is looking for messengers. You see, the fields are ripe for the picking. There are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. There are millions and millions of eunuchs out there waiting to be reached by Christ in the world today, right here in New Zealand. God wants to deploy an army of messengers. What kind of messengers? Messengers of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, submissive to authority, humble, bathed in the word, obedient. I've often thought about this guy that led me to Christ in India. What did it take for him to be on that street that day, November 2nd, 1976, ready to deploy John 3.16 to me? Kind of blows me away to think about that. I mean, God had to bring this Dutch guy all the way to New Delhi. You know, he was a missionary. And all he did was use one verse, five minutes, with a little bit of courage. 
That's the first key to successful evangelism ministry. Here's the second one. There needs to be, first of all, the preparation of the messenger. Secondly, there needs to be the preparation of the recipient. Very interesting. God prepared the recipient. And it is most interesting to see how God prepared this divine encounter. While Philip was being prepared in Jerusalem and Samaria, God was preparing the eunuch in Ethiopia and Jerusalem. What do we know about this guy? Verse 27, look. Verse 27. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch. First of all, he was Ethiopian. This is the country of Nubia, which today is really southern Egypt and Sudan. Secondly, we find out he was a eunuch. He was a castrated man so as to guarantee sexual irreproachability as a guardian of the king's harems. In verse 27, we also find out that he was a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. Wow. So he was a very important government official. He was the minister of treasury. He was in charge of all of her money. Top government post. Probably an extremely wealthy man. Probably actually riding in the desert with a whole entourage. He probably wasn't alone. We also find out he was a religious man. In verse 27, it also says, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship, to worship. He had no doubt come for the Pentecost celebrations in Jerusalem mentioned in Acts 2. He was probably a Gentile proselyte to Judaism. In other words, he was a Gentile, had converted to Judaism. And he had come to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem. He was now going home. He had traveled a huge distance to go to Jerusalem. We also find out he was a searching man. He was a searching man. In verse 27, it says, He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the Spirit of the Lord said, Go up and join this chariot. And Philip ran up and heard he was reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, No. How could I unless someone guides me? You see, it's clear here that his heart is still empty. He's unsatisfied. He's seeking. He's wondering. We know that because he actually gets saved in the story. So he's not saved. He was being led by the Pharisees. And you need to read Matthew 23 and you see how Jesus condemned the religion of the Pharisees. And this guy was being led astray by the Pharisees. No question about it. It was a corrupt religious system. So this man was seeking truth genuinely, but he was being fed error. And he's hungry. He's got a Bible, and he's reading it. He's reading the Scripture. He was wealthy. He had a copy of the scroll himself. But he doesn't understand what he's reading. So he says, he says, no, how could I unless someone guides me? And folks, This is where I get so excited as a missionary. By the way, he's reading, well, how could I unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation for his life is removed from the earth? He's reading and reading and reading, and he doesn't get it. When we first got to France 30 years ago, we were assigned into a little village called L'Arbrel, which is near Lyon, France. We just arrived there, and uh, we were looking for an apartment. And uh, the bakery is a typical little French town, beautiful, the orange tile, just like, like in the movies, you know. And so we're up this this little town with all the little shops, and there was a bakery there, and there was a sign that said we are renting an apartment. So we rang the little doorbell, walked in, and oh, the whiff of the croissant, ay, yeah, 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 yeah. That was like a deadly, you know, French bread day. And this little man came out in his white um, tablier, his white uh, apron, and he had his tuck, that white hat on, kind of a heavy set, short little man, just like in the movies, exactly. And he goes, "Hello," and we say, "Hello." He says, uh, what brings you here? And we say, we are looking for an apartment. He goes, oh, oh no, I, I said, we're looking for an apartment. And he goes, oh, well, why are you in Larbrell? And I said, I'm a pastor. And he goes, oh. And I go, oh. 
He goes, oh, really? And I go, oh. <laughs> then he says this. He says, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. He goes, my wife and I have just finished reading the entire Bible together, and we understand nothing. He says, could you help us figure it out? <laughs> Inside, I'm going, whoa. <laughs> Outside, I'm going, I would be glad to. <laughs> so we started Bible studies with him and his wife, and then they started bringing all their neighbors. We had two village Bible studies started within a couple of weeks. It was incredible. Folks, people are searching. People all around you are searching. In your family, your work colleagues, perhaps your pharmacist, perhaps it's your mechanic, perhaps it's your tax person, perhaps it's your professor, perhaps it's your neighbor. All of those people around you that don't know the Lord, some of them are searching. They really, really want to get it. They don't know the gospel. Their lives are empty. They're frustrated. They don't know how to deal with life problems. They're burned by their sin, and they're looking for a solution. I know because I was one of them. I went out to India trying to figure out life. You see, God prepares the recipient as he prepares the messenger. And we don't know that he's preparing one another. So this is where the third and final point comes in. This is so exciting. So what's the key to missions? What's the key to evangelism? Number one, God prepares the messenger. Number two, he prepares a recipient. Number, the recipient. Number three, here it is. Are you ready? Third point, God prepares the circumstances. God brings them together. What is neat to think is that Philip was being prepared in Jerusalem and Samaria. He had no idea God was preparing the eunuch down in Ethiopia to bring him up to Jerusalem to be able to meet Philip. And this is really the coolest point because the third ingredient to successful ministry is where God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory because it is God who brings the messenger and the recipient together. So here's going on. He's reading Isaiah 56. I right, just read those verses. And uh, it's a difficult passage. And so what happens? The eunuch answered Philip, verse 34, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? So you know what happens? I mean, Philip is down there in the desert road. He doesn't know what's going on. And suddenly he sees this chariot. And God says, go, go to this chariot. Go up, verse 29, go up to this chariot. So it says that Philip ran up. So here's the chariot, so now he's running. Okay, he's running to the chariot, that's what it says, okay? He runs up to the chariot. So you can just kind of see this chariot moving, and, and this guy running in the desert, and he comes up next to the chariot, then he probably stops, and then he's like walking along, and now he's listening to what the guy on the chariot is reading. That's what it says. Then he says, so he's hearing, he's hearing him read, and he says, do you understand what you're reading, sir? And the guy goes, oh, hello. No, I don't. I mean, it's kind of a weird situation. No, I don't understand. And he said, um, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Well, I maybe understand it. Well, would you like to come up, please, into my chariot and explain it to me? It's exactly what it says. He invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture was what I just read. Verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? Wow, this is the perfect missionary moment. You've been preparing your whole life for this moment and someone says, hey, I don't get it. Can you explain it to me? You whip out John 3.16. I mean, it's almost that simple. I mean, it really is. If the messenger is ready and if the recipient is ready, you just have to be ready. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Wow, could you do that? 
using only the Old Testament without your iPhone Bible on you. That's what he does. He preaches Jesus starting from that text from memory. Wonderful. And as they were along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, What prevents me from being baptized? Apparently, in his gospel presentation, he said, if you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will need to be baptized right away. So the guy sees water and says, hey, can I be baptized? So this is not the best manuscript in verse 37, but he says it's it's a true. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Isn't that amazing? You see how God gets the glory? He's looking for messengers. He's preparing the recipients. Now, here's the question. Suppose there were some prepared recipients right around here, right in your town. Let me ask you this. If God needed a prepared messenger, would he pick you? Would he pick you? Are you able to articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ using one verse in five minutes with a little bit of courage? That's what he's looking for. And if you can do that, folks, you're like a missionary. Because that's basically what we do. That's what missionaries do. Missionaries proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we wait for God to lead us to those people who are prepared. You know what the result of all this story was? Amazing. He was the first African convert. This began the road to missions to Africa. And it hadn't stopped since. And it won't stop until Jesus comes back. Amen? Amen. You want to see a few pictures of what I looked like in those days? (laughs) This is going real fast, but... uh, God was kind of fun. So anyway, that's kind of a, I took this picture from the airplane. <laughs> that was a joke, okay? okay. <laughs> so this is a trip, and you can kind of see, uh, to see you can't do this trip anymore just because many of those countries are obviously not very safe to travel in these days. Next picture. Next picture. <laughs> Next photograph. <laughs> Next PowerPoint image. <laughs> Um, ah, there we go, okay. <laughs> so that was, that was before like even the really long hair, but that was me, I don't know, yeah. What's that? Yeah, that was a much shot, that was, no, yeah, so when they got me out of jail, just kidding, no, that was, that was just a shot, okay, and I was wearing cool beads, did you notice, yeah. Okay, next, so this is actually the garden tomb, and up there is uh, the, the tomb of Jesus you can go into, next. This is Golgotha. You can actually see the skull head if you're kind of a little bit of imagination there. Next. This is inside the tomb. Who's had a privilege of going to Israel? Several of you? Yeah, it's really a wonderful thing to be able to do if you have a privilege of doing that. Next. This is actually the bus that we took to uh, India. We had to push it to start it every day. (laughs) And what's kind of amazing is that mountain is Mount Ararat. I didn't know anything about Mount Ararat, but that's actually where Noah, Noah's Ark uh, landed. So that's kind of cool to have been there. Next. This is a welcome to Afghanistan. This is where we were busted. Next. This is me thinking. Okay, because over there you think a lot. This is pre-salvation thinking. Next. This is a coffee house in Kabul, and this is the way it was. It was three U.S. cents for a, a pot of tea in those days. Next. That was me in, uh, in Kabul. <laughs> yeah. I don't dress like that anymore, actually, you know. <laughs> Next. Uh, this is the Taj Mahal in India. Next. And these are the missionaries. This was the 1970s, you can tell. They all had, like, you know, Jesus hair. 
But uh, this is the mis missionaries in Goa. The missionaries in Goa was there. Next. This is the house where we lived, and every night we could hear the coconuts falling. It was kind of interesting. And that's where the Lord found me, right there in India. And you can tell this is a really old picture. Look at my collar. Okay, it's really kind of funny. <laughs> but anyway, the Lord has been really good. And, you know, remember, the, the whole point here, God wants to use you, and God wants to use me to deploy his truth. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Thank you very much. Oh, that's our family. I'll tell you about them later, maybe.